today I'm here in Dallas and I'm with some amazing people, Ryan, Shannon, Haley, and Josh. They all host church at home in Louisiana and right here in Dallas. We're having church tonight and if you're coming, we can't wait to see you. Continue now a series entitled The Habits of a Righteous Life. By the way, if you're watching this, we are in Dallas, Texas. Beautiful Dallas, Texas. Is it true? Is everything bigger in Dallas? Oh, we are getting 100% confirmation here that everything is bigger in Dallas. That is awesome to hear. We are continuing a series called Habits of a Righteous Life. This is part five. We'll do one more part, part six. It'll be six different habits. And maybe you're thinking, all right, carbs. Carbs, I'm doing no carbs. Carbs are my enemy. It's what I tell myself every year. Sourdough toast, you are done this year. I was gonna say, you're toast, sourdough toast. <laughs> but like, you're done, right? And I, my habits last for such a short time. This literally happened during Thanksgiving break, okay? I'm sitting with my cousin who's named after my late father, Wendell, Wendell Jake McKinney, and he goes, you wanna do push-ups together? And I go, yes, I need to start doing more push-ups. You know it's bad when your wife of 22 years goes, she looks at you when you got your shirt off, okay? I'm not gonna get into the details, okay? <laughs> but I'm pretty fit. And for 43, like that's how you know you're getting old when you say I'm pretty fit and then you throw in your age. No one says I'm pretty fit for 18. You know, no one says that. It's always pretty fit for, here it comes, it's plus 40, 100%, yep, 43. Yeah, all right, you are, buddy, congrats, right? But the truth is, <clears throat> Chelsea has seen me with my shirt off and said, you know, babe, this is, this is such a wife trying not to discourage her super duper sensitive husband who literally <laughs> needs to grow up, okay? <laughs> That's me. And she goes, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing for you to kind of get back into push-ups again. <laughs> Remember, you were really doing a lot of push-ups, and you know, maybe that's something you'd want to think about. And I basically told her to mind her own business. That's what I told her. Um, no, so Wendell goes, you want to do more push-ups? And I go, yes, bro, I got to do more push-ups. He's like, let's do 25 right now. I do 25. Another discouraging element of the story is my wife goes, wow. <laughs> And I look up and I'm like, is that where we are? You don't think I can do 25 push-ups? Like, that's where we're at. That's how far we have fallen. Thanks, babe. So I do the 25 push-ups, and then my cousin Wendell looks at me. This is like day after Thanksgiving, right, when we all ate too much, and you're like, okay, I got to start. And he goes, bro, tomorrow, tomorrow, we're doing push-ups. We're doing 25 on the hour every hour tomorrow. And I go, let's go. <laughs> Right now, if he told me we're gonna do push-ups one time tomorrow, I'd be like, bro. But it, what he got me with was the degree of commitment was enticing to me. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't just want habits. I want habits Tom Brady keeps. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I want, I want habits that Dak Prescott, is that better? Okay, all right, some of you like your long faces the moment I said Tom Brady, which is everywhere in the NFL. You mentioned Tom Brady, everyone goes, oh. He's taken all of our Super Bowls, okay, from all of our teams. But have you heard about Tom Brady's day off? His cheat day, I shouldn't say day off, but his cheat day. Now, y'all know The Rock, right? The actor The Rock. Have you heard about his cheat day? Like you watch it on Instagram, he does like pancakes. He, does, he just goes crazy. That's my guy, right? Tom Brady's cheat day includes kale. He won't eat kale except on his cheat day. That's ridiculous. And you know what? that many Super Bowls, it's not worth it. It's actually not worth it. I don't want any Super Bowls if that's my cheat day. I want no Super Bowls. Like, I just want a bowl of cereal. I don't want Super Bowls. I want, so I love, but that's my nature, right? It's like, tell me what the champions do, right? Well, the champions in my mind do push-ups on the hour, every hour, 25 of them. Can you guess how many push-ups we did the next day? 
Uh, zero, to be exact. <laughs> absolutely zero push-ups the next day. And the truth is, it never occurred to us till we're getting tired watching, I think it was the new Will Smith movie, and we're watching it, and he goes, oh my God. Or he said, oh my word, I can't say, oh my God, I'm in Dallas. Oh my word. And I, I look over him and I go, what? He goes, push-ups. And I go, ah, uh, ah, tomorrow. <laughs> Guess how many we did the next day? Zero. Right, like, so if you're like me, if you're anything like me, habits is almost a trigger. I'm not like some of you. I'm really not. Chelsea will tell you this. I'm not a like, you know, I just said I'm gonna do it, and I'm just gonna do it. I don't have that kind of like champion level willpower, right? I, I'll be like, I am, I am having no smart sweets tonight, which is my favorite candy company in the history of the world. I love them so much. I'm having no smart sweets tonight, and I'm like, I'm gonna have one bag. And then I'm like, well, one bag was so good, I should have two. And imagine what three bags of smart sweets would be like. That's my life. I stopped by Whole Foods before I got to the studio in Dallas and I bought four bags of smart sweets at the thought that I might need them tonight after recording <laughs> these sermons. I have a problem. I am as average as you could possibly imagine. And when it comes to habits, good ones or bad ones, one of the things Chelsea's been harping, she's like, my sister said, Judah, what are you using on your skin? You know, we're getting older. My sister's 45, I'm 43. Her skin looks amazing. We just had dinner two nights ago and I go, oh, I knew you were gonna ask me. She goes, it looks pretty good. What are you using? I go, whatever hotel lotion I get from wherever we last were. And she's like, the body lotion? I'm like, yeah. I think the, the, the chemicals and stuff, I think they're like preservatives. They help. And she's like, you have to start using real lotion for your face. She goes, are you washing your face? And I'm like, not usually, no. And she's like, you have to wash your face. But I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not gonna stop using hotel body lotion. I'm probably not. Wait a minute, that's a habit. I have developed a very good habit or a bad habit. So if you feel like me at all, when we approach the subject of habits, like here we go again, I'm not great at this. I don't think I have it within me to develop. I want to suggest something just as we get back into the series. Now, what I do want to reference you to is part one of Habits of a Righteous Life. If you get a chance, I know you might be watching this right, right now at a neighbor's house and you're in your living room, but if you get an extra few minutes, 30 minutes or so, watch the first sermon we did in this series because we talk about Romans 14, 17, where it actually is in the middle of a context in Romans 14 where it's talking about the power of rules or actually the lack of the power of rules, that rules actually are not what Christianity is about. Romans 14, 17, for those that don't remember, some of you know that scripture, says the kingdom of God is not about rules, about eating or drinking, it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, that word righteousness in Romans 14, 17 is positional, more than practical. It's positional. And that position of righteousness before God only comes through the performance of Jesus, not your performance. And when you accept the performance of Jesus as your performance, you are righteous. Now that position evidently results in two predominant emotional dispositions called peace and joy. To say it plainly, two thirds of the domain of the king where Jesus reigns is an emotional disposition. And here's one of the critiques I have right now since 2019 amongst all Christians right now, and that is we are just as anxious as everybody else. And I think that might have to do with the cultural collusion with the teachings of Jesus. When it comes to habits, we immediately, like everybody else, go to willpower. And I'm here to suggest today that actually your habits are not to be developed based on willpower. They're going to include willpower. There's going to be some days you're going to wake up and go, I'm going to do it anyways, right? And it's like, that's a little bit of willpower. But guess what? Jesus is going to empower your willpower, Right, and that's why I believe Paul said, was it, he goes, I labored more abundantly than you all. Remember what the apostle Paul, yet not I. It was the power of Christ working through me. And that's that tension. Was it my willpower saying no to that affair so I didn't ruin my marriage? Was it just my will or was God energizing me to say no? Was he giving me the strength to resist temptation. What was that? I'd like to think it was the Holy Spirit, the holy power of God enabling your willpower. And when we understand that the performance of Jesus makes us right with God, it gives us a sense of peace and joy. Now from that place, we begin to develop daily worship. 
daily sacred habits of worship every day. And so my question to you again today as we're continuing the series is, what are you doing for daily worship? What is your daily worship like? Now, the reason I don't use devotions is because that's like elevator music now in Christianity. When I say devotions, you go, part of you, grown up so long in church, I say devotions, and you literally, your shoulders sink. You don't even see it. You physically are like, oh, God, not devotions, right? Because that's a low point for you. You don't pray enough. You don't read your Bible enough. You don't go to church enough. You don't know enough of the Bible. You've never read a, a doctrine book. You, you don't really know who the old preachers are. You don't know the philosophers and the theologians. You know more about your football team than you do about eternity. You know, and you're like, I don't, I don't know. So I want to talk to you about worship. Are you worshiping every day? I want to take a little bit of the misnomer away. What are you doing for worship? And that brings us to part five. One of the most amazing habits we can begin to develop, not by resolve, but by responding to the gift of Jesus, is this idea of worshiping God through the words we use. Worshiping God through the words we use. In any given day, you can speak as, I think it's like 13,000 words. For me, it's probably 16 to 18,000 words. For Chelsea, it's probably 4,000 words. I can't remember the last day where Chelsea, at some point during the day, didn't say, I'm out of words. And I thought, oh, what a dream that would be <laughs> to be actually out of words. I don't know if I've ever, ever been out of words. In fact, if I was out of words, I would take time to tell you all the details of why I was out of words. I would explain to you what the feelings are like when you're out of words, right? That, and then it'd be like, oh wait, no, I've never, literally never out of words. So however many words you speak, over your lifetime, we've talked about this, you'll speak some 300 million words. A great psychiatrist years ago decided to interview uh, senior citizens who were most likely about to die. Now that might sound morbid to you, okay, so bear with me. But he decided, I'm gonna interview these senior citizens, all very advanced in age, even their physical st state and their health, they, they were going to be dead soon. That was his assessment of the 1,200 senior citizens. And he said there was one overwhelming theme amongst almost all of those people who were quite literally preparing to die. Looking back over their lifetime, nearly every single senior citizen talked to expressed in some way that they regretted worrying so much in their life. Each and every one of them took a moment to say, you know, I wish I wouldn't have worried. Now, I want to tell you the primary way you worry, whether you like it or not, the primary way you worry is with your words. It's the primary way you worry. Do you know they say that 80% of social media conversations is gossip? Which, by the way, is worrisome in nature. Think about it. It's kind of a, it's a cousin to worry. Gossip's a cousin to worry. Well, have you heard, I, you know, and you know, I mean, she, and then he, and you know, I, you know, and, and sometimes you're just gossiping because their demise is your victory and you feel better because other people are worse than you. That's why reality TV works because we want to watch other people's lives fall apart so we don't feel ours is as much falling apart. But if we're really honest, unless we consider what Jesus has done, and that's why I think the practice of daily confession, that's what I want to talk to you about, daily confession, which is just a nice, sophisticated word for how you talk during your day. But how you talk during your day, right? Are you gossiping? Are you worrying? Are you worshiping? Your breath is precious. Your words are precious. I want to remind you, church home, it was words that created this world. Before there was dirt, before there were oceans, before there were hills, before there were eagles, before there were human beings, before there was art, before there was music, before there was culture, there was God with his words. And his words made what we hold to be so true. Think about it. We think this wall is more real than our words. 
But which came first, the wall or the words? The words. So by nature, whatever's first typically oftentimes is more powerful, faster. Right? Words are more powerful than this wall. They are. And, and, and any of us have lived any extent of life, we realize like, yeah, words are very, very powerful. Now, if you struggle with sarcasm, I am your guy. By now, you know that. I am literally my, my sweet father. God bless him. He's gone on to eternity. There wasn't a sarcastic bone in this man's body. And pray for the church. Pray for the church in Seattle who sat under my dad's ministry and now for 11 years has sat under my ministry because my sarcasm knows no bounds. It even gets involved in sermons, and I like it, right? Like, so I understand sarcasm. I understand satire. I understand having a good time. I understand not taking yourself too seriously. But every now and again, in fact, every single day, I'll feel the caution of my wonderful, gracious Heavenly Father saying, okay, that's enough. Yeah. Hey, no, speak life. Are you considering the words you use? Are you considering the words? Are you considering the effect that those words have? Listen to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Never let an ugly or hateful word come from your mouth. But I like, I'm reading it to you in the Passion Translation because I like the word ugly. Ugly. And you know what's amazing about that colorful word, ugly, is that um, it's got a newness to it for me. You know, I see the word hateful and I'm like, well, I know what those words are. But ugly is an interesting word because it's an intuitive term. Somehow you know when you're being ugly. Love that jacket. And it's a pop but it's ugly. Wow, must be nice. Is that your new Rolls Royce car? Wow, must be nice. That's ugly. You're complimenting him, but are you? Wow, right? Like, I mean, don't get me started. I will defend my buddies who play professional sports as the day is long, but I hear people making loaded comments about my friends who are professional athletes, and it's like, wow, can't throw anymore. We need to move on from that guy, you know, and it's like, it's ugly. It's just ugly. I don't know how to say it. It's just ugly. It's an ugly way to speak about other human beings, to speak about life. Are you using ugly words? Are you using ugly words with yourself? You know who you believe the most? Not me. Some of you are like, I've really never heard you preach before, so of course I don't. Okay, fair enough. But some of you have heard me preach and you're like, no, I really do believe you. No, 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 but you believe you the most. I don't care what podcast, shout out, Chelsea and I just started a new podcast called In Good Faith. Please join us. But you know whose podcast you listen to the most? You. You are the number one subscriber and contributor. You. And you're constantly feeding yourself. Instead, let your words become a beautiful gift that you encourage others with. Now, here's what I love about that imagery from the, the, the writer of Ephesians. When we prepare a gift, when you prepare a gift, you, you, well, there it is. You prepare it. You think about it. You think about it. You think about it. Let me ask you a question. When you go to coffee to someone, with someone, here's something you can do if you want to learn the daily act of using your words as worship. What if on your way to have coffee with someone, you prepared encouraging words like you would prepare a physical, tangible gift? I'm talking about daily acts of, of worship. I'm talking about daily habits, the habit of confession. You know what's interesting? A lot of people will tell you, like, listen, those few moments where you have positive confession during the day, I know who you really are, because late at night you come home to this house and you are so ugly and you are so mean. Don't let anybody trick you. Listen to me. Every little step matters. And if the only thing you do is at least once a day, you prepare your words like a gift, the rest of the day you might be ugly, but you got to start somewhere. And so I'm, so I'm actually being so serious. Last night we went to dinner with one of my best friends and some new friends. And while I was sitting at the table, I know this might sound strange to you, but I started asking God, will you give me words of encouragement during this dinner? Insightful, meaningful words that I can give as a gift. And one of our favorite things to do amongst our friends is when someone gives you a compliment, you know, go, ah, but we go, thank you for saying that. That means thank you for, which is also another way of accepting someone's gift. Thank you for saying that. The cool thing about gift giving too is it's so fulfilling. And by the way, you'll be far happier, Jesus said, giving 
than you'll ever be getting. If you want people to speak kinder to you and give gifts in the form of words to you, instead of confronting them and being ugly about it, you never encourage me, right? The cardinal sin of any marriage, this is, now we're doing marriage tips for 2022, okay? And that is the words always and never, always and never, always and never. But guess what? It can wreak havoc on your other relationships too. You never encourage me. Well, they're probably less likely to encourage you now since you spoke that. Yeah, it, it, it really has power. Your brain's listening. Some people be like, it, it must be just this mystical power that words have. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes it's just that we hear them and then we believe them and then we start acting different because we heard words and we believe them. Here's my little tip to you. If you wish people packaged words for you like gifts, start doing it for others. Start doing it for others. If you feel like your whole family's ungrateful and no one recognizes you and no one celebrates you, and it's the holiday season and it's the new year and you were hoping that you would go home for Christmas and Thanksgiving and your mom would finally change and she wouldn't be so negative and she would be so positive, but she was worse, she was worse. And you confronted your mom and you got in the car and you drove home. And then you're wondering like, why didn't it get better? Because it, it, it probably won't, will it? But again, in light of Jesus, in light of Jesus' performance, his gift of righteousness, which produces a peace and joy in you, 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 you have everything pertaining to life in God. You lack no good thing, the scripture says. Why don't you start preparing gifts in the form of phrases and statements? I'll give you one last little tip. One of my favorite things to do with people that I know is think ahead of time about one of the, my favorite qualities about that person that makes them great, because everyone's great. Everyone's a miracle. But what is it? Last night I was telling my friends about their empathy. It's their empathy that moves me. It's their empathy that I think is, is the secret to their marriage. They both are very empathetic and it's beautiful to watch. And I felt like I was giving my friends a gift who, by the way, I've known for 11 or 12 years, but it never gets old. What if, what, in, what, in, what if instead, I, now this is, this is crazy, what if instead at a birthday party, and some of you are so good at this, I can tell it on your face, and some of you watching, I'm sure you're good at this, but sure, give the gift, give the baseball card, you know, give the new car, give the new watch. You're like, new car, who's doing that? You know what, <laughs> but like, yeah. but, but also give the gift of words, speak life, speak life. And I wanna share one last scripture with you and then we'll be, We'll conclude um, part five here of Habits of a Righteous Life. Listen to this scripture. I actually just saw this last couple days and it blew me away. Colossians 4, 6. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace and tempered with truth and clarity. I'm going to say it again. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace. It, do, you know what grace is, right? Drenched with grace. It doesn't mean drenched with kindness, drenched with sweetness. It means drenched with the idea, the concept, and the thought of the free gift we've received from God in the person of Jesus. I must read it again. Let every word you speak be drenched with the reality that the performance of Jesus made you right with God. Let every word you speak be drenched with the reality that you have received righteousness with God, the creator of through the performance of Jesus. And then it says, let it be tempered with truth and clarity for, for then, period, two sentences, for then you'll be prepared to give a respectful answer to anyone who asks about your faith. Did you say that? I'm, I'm gonna read the whole verse now. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace, tempered with truth and clarity for then, then you'll be prepared to give a respectful answer to anyone who asks about what you believe. So you saw the, you saw, Colossians is literally saying, people will come up to you because of the way you talk and will say, what do you believe in? When in reality, I love you church home, when I love you because we're so far into this together now, I've been doing this almost 12 years, I can tell you the absolute truth. Our reputation in the Western world is not Colossians 4.6. It's not Colossians 4.6. We are just as divisive, we are just as opinionated. We are just as gossipy. We are just as upset, sometimes just as selfish and ugly with our words as anybody else. 
And yet the Bible says, let every word be drenched with the overwhelming idea that it's not your performance that makes you who you are, it's Jesus' performance. Which, by the way, your words are always gonna be full of gratitude, always gonna be words full of words like, wow, amazing, thank you, incredible, so that finally someone will come up to you and say, I gotta know, man, what is it that you believe in? Because the way you talk is different. The way you talk is different. I want the way I talk in 2022 to be different. I don't just mean different from me, but different from status quo. Are we building one another up? One of the translations of Colossians and Ephesians talks about everything we do when we speak, we ought to be builders, not destroyers. Are you a builder with your words? Now, when you begin to lack energy towards this, when you begin to wane in your habit of confession, when you begin to, begin to get weary, and, and here's the reality, you say about 13,000 words a day, give yourself a little grace while you're at it. You're gonna have a moment or two where it's like, my sister and I were laughing, she's like there was a lady from their church recently in Las Vegas, and she left church and someone cut her off and she flipped them off only to, to realize it was her friend from church, you know? And, and she was dead serious too. It wasn't one of those like, I'm kind of having fun with you. It was like, I hate you, you know? And, and they just laughed at it because it's like, give us 15 minutes outside the church parking lot. And I mean, you know, I saw a meme recently and it's like this older lady leaving a church parking lot and she's like, the pastor's done preaching, church is over, now it's time to be rude for everyone in the service industry. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's our reputation as church people. It's like, instead of a tip, we're gonna leave a track, right? It's like, we, we, we wanna be people who reflect the fact that we are who we are. What does it say? By the grace of God, Paul says. What's the grace of God? It's the free gift of God through the person of Jesus. What's the grace of God? It's that the performance of Jesus makes me who I am, not my own performance. And that ought to dramatically affect our words. Daily confession. I believe that ought to be a holy, sacred habit that we practice every single day. Now.